Do you want to truly understand hypocalcemia so you can remember it for your next exam? Well, in this video, we break down the symptoms, causes, and treatment of hypocalcemia. I break it down really simply and focus on high yield test content. So if you're ready to have your mind blown, then tap the like button and let's get started. So if we take the word hypocalcemia and we break it down, hypo means low, calc is the prefix for calcium, and emia means blood. So hypocalcemia therefore is a low blood calcium level. Normal blood calcium is a range between 9 and 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. So hypocalcemia therefore is a blood calcium level of less than 9. So because 99% of calcium is stored in the bone, calcium is really important for bone strength. And this is why we were always told as kids to drink milk if we wanted strong bones. Calcium is also really important for blood clotting. It's required for all but two steps in the coagulation cascade. And fun fact, if you were able to take all the calcium out of a blood sample, the blood would not clot in the test tube. Within the cell, calcium entering the cytoplasm causes contraction of muscle fibers. Remember that action potentials in muscles cause the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium will then bind troponin, which moves tropomyosin out of the way. Myosin heads can then bind to actin and cause actin to move, which we see on a macro level as muscle contraction. Plasma calcium levels also affect the excitability of neurons. Calcium acts like a sodium channel blocker. It sits in front of the sodium channel and won't let sodium into the cell. Thou shalt not pass. And the flow of sodium into a cell is responsible for depolarization and an action potential. When calcium levels are low, Calcium is not blocking sodium from entering the cell. This means that sodium can flow easily into a cell and cause depolarization. So neurons become hyperexcitable with hypocalcemia. Calcium enters the body through the gastrointestinal tract and is absorbed through the intestines. However, in order for calcium to be absorbed, vitamin D must be present. After calcium is absorbed, it is stored in the bone or excreted by the kidneys. So if there's a problem with the absorption, excretion, or storage of calcium, it can throw off our blood calcium levels. So hypocalcemia can be caused by a decreased absorption of calcium, an increased excretion of calcium, and a decreased amount of free blood calcium. Decreased calcium absorption can be caused by an inadequate oral intake of calcium. If we're not taking in calcium, then we certainly can't absorb it. Under this, we include people who are lactose intolerant because major sources of calcium are milk and milk products. Malabsorption syndromes also fall under decreased calcium absorption, and these include things like celiacs and Crohn's disease. Both of these diseases are characterized by autoimmune destruction of the small intestine. Once small intestinal cells are destroyed, we cannot absorb things like calcium. And then an inadequate intake of vitamin D can also cause decreased calcium absorption. Like we said earlier, vitamin D is very necessary for the absorption of calcium from the intestines. Chronic kidney disease actually falls under decreased calcium absorption as well. So vitamin D that's taken into the body, either through the sun, diet, or supplements, is in an inactive form. The kidneys convert this to an active form, that way it can be used by the body. In kidney disease, however, the kidneys cannot make vitamin D into its active form. And we have already said that we need vitamin D to absorb calcium. So if the kidneys cannot make vitamin D into its active form, then we cannot absorb calcium and we will get hypocalcemia. Increased calcium excretion can occur with diarrhea. 
Diarrhea is often due to an increased motility in the intestines. If our intestines are moving quickly, then calcium does not have as much transit time to get reabsorbed. And since the intestines are the primary site of calcium absorption, diarrhea will cause hypocalcemia. So free calcium is calcium that's just floating around in the blood, not bound to anything. And this calcium is what is able to actually be used by the body for action potentials and other needs. So when we bind this calcium to something else, like proteins or albumin, we can't use it anymore and it will drop our blood calcium levels and cause the signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. So say we have all this free calcium in our blood and then this calcium starts dating albumin and now they're a thing and calcium can't go out anymore and do things like cause action potentials. And anyways, I don't know why I used a dating reference, but I hope you get it. Alkalosis can decrease our free calcium levels. So alkalosis increases the binding of calcium to albumin, which leaves little free calcium and will drop our calcium levels. And to remember this, I just think of my anxious patients. When they hyperventilate, this causes a respiratory alkalosis because they are breathing off all their carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is an acid. And these patients will come in freaking out with tingling around their lips and their hands. And sometimes they'll come in like this and have these carpopedal spasms because they've effectively caused hypocalcemia. Pancreatitis can also decrease our free calcium levels. In pancreatitis, there is an increase of fatty acids in the blood. This is because in pancreatitis, lipase gets released and breaks down triglycerides. Triglyceride breakdown leads to free fatty acids, which bind to free calcium and therefore cause hypocalcemia. High phosphate can also cause hypocalcemia. Phosphate and calcium are opposites. When phosphate is high, calcium is low and vice versa. And to remember this, I like to think of them as two kids on a teeter-totter. When one is up, the other is down. Another cause of decreased availability of calcium is the removal of the parathyroid glands or hypoparathyroidism. So the parathyroid glands are little endocrine glands located behind the thyroid and they are super important in calcium regulation. And the primary purpose of the parathyroid glands are to secrete parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone increases calcium levels in the blood. Parathyroid hormone will first go to the bone and take calcium out of the bone. That way it can go to our bloodstream and increase calcium levels. Second, it tells the kidneys to increase the reabsorption of calcium. And third, it tells the kidneys to make the active form of vitamin D, which we know is important in the absorption of calcium from the GI tract. And I apologize for my drawing. I know it looks a lot like Man Ray from SpongeBob. Massive blood transfusions can also cause hypocalcemia. And I'm not sure you'll find this one on the NCLEX, but if you work in an ER after graduation, then this is important. Anytime you're giving multiple units of blood, you'll want to check a calcium level because there's an agent in blood called citrate that they put in the blood to prevent it from clotting. This agent absorbs the free calcium. And the reason they use this is because calcium causes blood clotting. And you probably don't want blood to clot in the bag while you're trying to transfuse it. And then immobility is the last example I have for you. So when we aren't moving, so say you have a patient on bed rest, you're not stimulating bone growth and your bones can get weak. To prevent this, the body takes calcium that's in the blood and deposits it in the bone matrix to help increase bone density. Because of the physiology that we talked about earlier, in the musculoskeletal system, hypocalcemia will cause things like muscle twitching and muscle spasms. The problem with hypocalcemia though, is that because it increases muscle hyperactivity, severe hypocalcemia can lead to tetany or sustained muscle contraction. 
you might see both a positive Trousseau's and a positive Chivostec sign with hypocalcemia. Chivostec sign occurs when you tap the facial nerve and see reflexive contraction of the facial muscles. And that was me trying to imitate that sign, not me trying to wink at you. And Trousseau sign is a spasm of the wrist and hand when you pump up a blood pressure cuff on that arm. And in order to remember these, I think Trousseau rhymes with bow. And bow is this big football player that's trying to flex his muscles. And Chivostek, Chivostek was an Austrian guy and he's trying to wink at you. Neurologically, hypocalcemia leads to tingling or paresthesias that are often in the hands or around the lips. In the respiratory system, tetany can occur in the diaphragm and in severe cases cause asphyxiation. In the gastrointestinal tract, increased muscle activity leads to hyperactive bowel sounds, abdominal cramping, and diarrhea. In the cardiovascular system, hypocalcemia will cause arrhythmias and prolonged ST segments and QT intervals. So here you have a cardiac action potential. At the top of depolarization, calcium channels open and calcium flows into the cell. If calcium, however, is really low outside the cell due to something like hypocalcemia, then calcium cannot flow down its concentration gradient, and it will take a longer time for calcium to get into the cell, and that will drag out the plateau phase. And because the plateau phase is the beginning of repolarization and relaxation, it will take longer for the heart to repolarize. And the T wave on the EKG is repolarization of the ventricle. So that will just delay the T wave. And this T wave delay we call QT or ST prolongation. So for the diagnosis of hypocalcemia, draw a metabolic panel and see that the calcium level is less than 9 milligrams per deciliter. Also, you will want to complete an EKG and see QT or ST prolongation. Because these patients are at risk for fractures, enact fall precautions. Additionally, you'll want to give calcium orally or intravenously. As regards IV calcium, you'll want to administer it slowly. Because calcium affects the heart, you never want to bolus this medication. Additionally, you'll want to observe for signs of infiltration because infiltration of calcium can cause tissue necrosis. You'll also want to administer medications that increase calcium absorption. And these include things like vitamin D and aluminum hydroxide, which is actually an antacid. You'll also want to encourage your patient to eat foods high in calcium. Any dairy product is going to be really high in calcium. So think things like milk, cheese, and yogurt. But what if your patient's vegan? Well, good news. They have options too. They can eat things like tofu and leafy green vegetables. And then rhubarb and sardines are also high in calcium. So you can just bake them up a rhubarb sardine pie and there you go. You practically fix their hypocalcemia. <coughs> hey guys, welcome back. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them in a comment down below. And if you wanna see specific videos, type that in a comment as well. For other electrolyte videos, click or tap the screen right here. Otherwise, don't forget to subscribe, that way I can see you next video.